Welcome to the Matthew Lyle Show. It's your host, Matthew Lyle, joined by back-to-back guest, Michael Bucknasty Buckheister. It's January 15th. How are you doing today, sir? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, we had a pretty good Duke-Clemson game this like this past night, so I mean, anytime I get to watch good college b- b- basketball, it's a very good night. And so what, what was, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I did not watch. What was the score of that one? Well, at the time of this recording, it's a 55-53 Clemson lead. You know, even though this is a show where we're going to talk all sports, all of all, you know, all over the nation, uh, I'm a Kentucky fan, so I just looked and uh, I see that Louisville is losing, and I am a diehard Louisville <laughs> hater. So it, it's <laughs> nice to see them down 61 to 60 versus Pitt with 45 seconds to go, Mike. So also, some breaking news came across: Luke Keekley just retired. What's your thought? I think he's 28 years old. Still kind of at the top of his game. I don't know right. if he's still at the peak, but I thought he still gave us, at least in what little bit of Carolina football I watched, he was still giving us some good action. You think this is just, you think this is concussion related? I haven't looked into it, so if this has already been out there, I don't want to hear it. But, Mike, do you think this is concussion related? Do you think this is, hey, my body's more important to me related? What do you think it is? Well, coming from a linebacker spot, uh, I personally played linebacker at a very high level too. You get a lot of concussions. I mean, like they may not be diagnosed con- like concussions, but you get your bell rung quite a few, few, few times, and you shake it off. If I remember correctly, last year, uh, the twenty nineteen season or the twenty eighteen, I'm, I'm, I'm not for sure how we figure it, NFL season. Last season, uh, he was he had his fifth or sixth concussion since he was in the pros. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's not concussion issue. At the same time, you know, football is hard on your body. You know, you 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 play five, six, seven years, you are waking up, you're struggling to, to put your shoes on like in the morning. I mean, he has made his money. He should be set for life. You know, uh, you know, maybe he just he, he he just needs a break. Maybe he needs to do a uh, uh, Jason that he did for the Cowboys. You know, he took a year off. He broadcast in the booth, horrible at it, came back and had a pretty good season. So may- maybe he just needs a mental break. But I, I, I got to chalk it up to the concussions. So two points there. I, I, I do think, I do think Jason Witten's thing was a little different because. I mean, who wouldn't want to partake in great football like that? You know, it, it was a tight end, you know, because the rules are changing and growing so much right. that if you're a receiver, you're a tight end, whatever you may be, you're going to get up. You could probably play until you're in your 40s if you don't take a, a catastrophic hit. So I think that was a little different with Witten. But I think, and I don't know this situation with Luke Keekley, but I think we are in a society now where it's uh, unless you are playing a position like quarterback or receiver or maybe even DB where you can play it at a high level for quite some time and make a you know a really good living keep garnering you know keep garnishing those checks i i think it's almost smart to play 5 6 7 years and then when you feel your body declining a little bit getting out and doing doing a podcast, right? You know, I, I watched a pod. I watched a little podcast slash you know vlog, whatever you want to call it, of uh, Chris Long. I, I believe that's the, is that the one it is the the one that went to the Rams. You know, he's in great shape now. Doesn't right. look near as big as he was as a player. Putting out great content. I think he had you know he, he's got you know he's got plenty of contacts, so he's always putting out. Uh, he's got great guests. So, and I don't know if he ever got a ring, and I don't know if that's his is important anymore, but I think you have an opportunity to, to get out before you get hurt too bad before you have any lasting effects. You've made a good chunk of money, especially if you've taken care of your finances and there's still an audience out there. Everybody does podcast. Everybody does a radio show. I mean, look, Mike, me and you, we're doing this and and we have none of that kind of level of expertise. So, you know, with all the platforms, it's almost you, you you enter the league at 22, you play to your 30, you get out at 30, 
You enjoyed 10 more years of being in the public's eye, you know, talking about Super Bowl, getting out of Barstool Sports, getting in this platform, doing your own podcast, doing some side work with ESPN. And then when you're 40, you got your health ahead of you. Now you can fully retire. You still got your health. You've made a pretty good living. You got a nice little nest egg. I actually wouldn't be surprised if we see this happening more and more for players outside of linebackers. And if you look, who's been kind of now he I know his situation's a lot different than this, but who's kind of been the villain of this NFL season? And the guy barely played a snap. Well, he played a little bit, but not much. Antonio Brown. And right. I don't I don't know what side effects he actually endured while, you know, taking a hit from Burfick, people like to joke about or whatever it might be. But that man could be well out of football. And he's in the he's he's still getting in the limelight in a very negative manner. So get out before I think there's a lot of guys. Unlike like I said, the guys that are at the elite aren't going to do this. You know, the guys that are still getting huge well, paychecks. Well, you can't say that because I believe Harry Standard was was an elite player. Yeah, uh, but come on, like Mike. That, year, that's like one person like every decade. That's like one. I'm talking well, like when you start seeing mid tier guys. Guys that are um, not in the top twenty of stats, okay, but household names. You know what I'm saying? Like right. Luke Kuechly. That's probably a bad example because I do think he was playing at a high level. Yeah, but like top five. Okay, easy. I'm I'm, I'm going to use this name. I, I'm not saying that he should do this. I'm not saying that he's going to do this. But uh, uh, another position because the guy's quarterback. But could you imagine like the wide receiver version of Kirk Cousins, the guy yeah. that you know who he is? Wes Walker. He, yeah, well, so I got had a lot of head damage, and, and so does <laughs> Julian Edelman. But guys like that, Mike, you know, guys that yeah. aren't a number one, but they get out instead of being special teams dummy, instead of going across the middle dummy, instead of just risking it. I think you're slowly going to see that. And let's be honest, the way that the the game keeps moving faster and faster, you got to have linebackers who can track down guys like Lamar Jackson and Deshaun Watson. You got to have guys that can hawk these guys down. It's kind of a young man's game. Right. And and so I, I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting. I hate to see, you know, you always hate to see a, a, a big guy like that, the guy that was a 99 on Madden just a few years ago, be uh, be out the league like that. But well, well, very interesting. Well, well, and like just to add to some points there, you know, he may only be 28 years old, but he's been playing football for probably yeah. 20 years. Like tackle football, he's probably been playing that for 20 years. That takes a wear and tear on your body. It, it like it, like it, it is hard to mentally prep for a game every week. You know, like it, it, like it, it is just not a physical game. It's a mental game too. And if your heart is is not in the game, like if you don't enjoy waking up, going to practice, like just like just like every day, I mean, maybe it is time to hang them up. Fair enough. And that is the time you're hearing this in the morning. That is the latest breaking news you ever hear. Uh, I think you'll probably hear that about 12 hours from now. So I'm sure you've already formed your own opinion, but that's our opinion on that. Mike, let's continue to keep bottle feeding late news. Let's talk about what happened late last night or late Monday night. We didn't get a chance to cover this on the last night's show. National Championship College Football. We've crowned a title without a doubt. With at no surprises here, it was LSU. It was Joe Burrow with an X, like they do down there with the Go Tigers. <laughs> they made Clemson look average. And right. now there was a lot of debate on truly how good Clemson was. But Clemson showed me a thing or two when they beat Ohio State. Because I thought, I, I truly thought that this year you had. LSU penthouse living in the top. Right. Sharing the opposite side of that room was Ohio State. Right down below them, and an equally as nice room, but just not the penthouse view, was Clemson, Oklahoma, maybe Georgia, if they could have been firing on all cylinders. And then you had the rest of the country. But it looked like, and then after Clemson beat Ohio State, I thought, okay, okay, uh, uh, Trevor Lawrence has them has them being in in this penthouse. But last night showed you that 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 was just LSU's. That was Joe Burrow's. Big bleep Joe, if you saw his hat. 
He was out there. You had uh, you had Odell Beckham handing out money. He was just handing out. What, what's yeah. going on here? He just, and he comes and tries to come out and say it's fake money. No, you son, you weren't out there with monopoly he was money. Wasted. Too, that was cold man. hard cash. Which hey, I don't know the NCAA rule. I could care less. I, I'm all for it. Apparently, the NCAA doesn't care. I think uh, uh, Odell Beckham gave the whole squad uh, beats or some kind of uh, ear earphones yeah. or headphones. So I don't really care about all that. I just don't try to insult our integ- our intelligence <laughs> by saying, oh, that's monopoly money, that's fake money. And I think, I mean, for the most part, the game was over. He can give that to the Jefferson kid, right, because he's going pro. So I don't know I don't know when your eligibility ends. Why not five minutes after your last game? Um, but Joe Burrow, bald, dominated, through 60 touchdowns this year. Be inter- I'd be interesting to see how many how long it takes him to get to 60 touchdowns for the Cincinnati Bengals. Which that's that's a foregone conclusion, right? Like he's he's rocking the orange and black next year. He's going from one tiger to another. He's going from a, a right. an LSU tiger to a Cincinnati Bengal, which hey, I don't a lot of people are like to I think everybody I think we got to a point now where these kids are so confident and and brazen kind of they'll just come out. I think we always expect the next Eli Manning in the oh, I'm not going to that trash team. You know, right. a lot of people, oh, a Baker's going to say that to the Browns or this player's going to say that to that team. Hey, I, I don't think people do that anymore because it doesn't matter what horrible squad you play on. You're getting the NFL money. You're getting the NFL love. And Joe Burrow is from Ohio. So if you and, – and I don't think he's buying the fact that the Bengals are a, a trash squad. I think you got that level of confidence. When you're rocking that level of confidence, Mike – you think you can turn this around. I mean, yeah. you wore a hat and smoked a cigar that said Big Bleep Joe. He thinks he's going to take his Big Bleep Joe to Cincinnati and and turn that around. And if you're a quarterback and you've been throwing to some nice receivers, Tyler Boyd, A.J. Green, if he's there, Joe Mixon in the backfield, you know, I don't know what that, – that team has a whole lot of problems it needs to fix. But don't be surprised if he's not excited to go back home and play with that team. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I definitely hear everything that Asher's saying. Uh, my biggest concern about Joe in the in the NFL is is that he was on such a good team at LSU, and uh, well, I got forget what uh, he was at Ohio State, right? Be, before, right, right, yeah, right. So, I mean, so we see when things don't go his way. He kind of jumped ship, you know, like he was not the starter at Ohio State. Things weren't going his going going his way. He jumped ships and he goes to uh, to LSU and the weapons a weapons around him. He exploded in, into uh, should be the number one overall pick. My question, like the red flags that are raising in my head right now, is this the Ryan Leaf syndrome? You know, is he does he have such a big ego? that you can't tell him anything. You can't say, hey, you're doing this wrong. Is he an uncoachable? Um, I, 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 I am really intrigued to see him go to Cincinnati, not because I want him to fail, just to ju- just for him to prove me wrong that he is not going to be like Ryan Leaf in the NFL. Yeah, I, I don't – I mean, I've not heard any report to say he's uncoachable by any manner. I just – I think he's going to fit now. I think he's going to have growing pains. And he's he's I have a always I always have this weird mentality when it comes to college quarterbacks. And Joe Burrow's going to be a weird one because when these kids go to Ohio State, when you look back and they've gone to USC, when they've done these things, they typically struggle. They typically don't pan out well. And, and I would be a firm believer it's because when you when you're a top when you're a top quarterback in a class, you know, in high school, you play with the greatest athletes because you play at a dominant level in high school. Then you go to college and you're behind a five-star line and you throw into five-star receivers. And then you get to the NFL and you're now getting beat up and you got to get used to losing. Joe Burrow has been through some things and this LSU team wasn't doing this last year. So 
I'm very interested to see how that translates. That's why this year I got a lot of flack and I said, give me Daniel Jones over Haskins because Daniel Jones led the, led the nation and dropped passes. Right. No, he knows what it's like to get busted in the mouth by a bad blocking scheme. Daniel Jones knows what it's like to have throw to a mediocre receiver and have that drop. Haskins didn't. Right. And even though Jones struggled a little bit, the Giants, he was used to struggling. The Giants struggled. He was used to that. When Haskins got to Washington, he said it. There was a clip he said himself. He wasn't used to this bleep. He wasn't used to losing. So Burrow's been through some things that, that show me and tell me, hey, he's here for the struggle. But he's also, like you said, Mike, he's played on a loaded team. I don't know how long it's going to take him to shake that off. I think he might be one of those that fall through the cracks like, um, you know, kind of Baker Mayfield, even though he had a down year last year, and what you might see from Kyler Murray, where you naturally struggle due to the the way you play the position, that you're used to the struggle when you get to the pros. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I do think he's – I do think he is going to be a bingo. I think that's pretty much a foregone conclusion. Cincinnati, you are on the clock. We are going to take a quick break. Got to make a little money from our sponsors and our ads. So when we get back, we're going to talk more championship football. We're going to talk about what went wrong with Trevor Lawrence. And we're going to get in some other sports on the Matthew Lyle Show. Welcome back to the Matthew Lyle Show. It's your host, Matthew Lyle, joined by back-to-back co-host champion, Michael Bucknasty Buckheister. How you doing, Big Mike? We've already, Man, the, already said that. We already yeah. said that, Mike. Look at me. I'm already ready to go. I was already hyped. Introduction. <laughs> I was introducing you again as if, as if they didn't know you were already here. I'm so here. We left. We, was talk, we talked LSU. LSU. First off, let me ask you this, Mike. Where does LSU and Joe Burrow rank in the all-time greatest seasons? Oh, it, it's it's probably got to be top five because, like, if I if if my memory serves me right, Joe Joe Burrow did break the all-time passing record in NCAA it was, history. Yeah, it was uh, fifty-eight, and now it's sixty. And right, he uh, owes the sixty. I mean, Sprinkled well, in with a side of rushing touchdowns. Yeah, I mean they they were fifteen and zero. I feel like anytime LSU beats Alabama, that's a plus on their season. But beating them Certainly the way is. they beat them, and like if I don't think they really had one close game like all year. They pretty much that Alabama game fight. is kind of the closest one. Yeah. That if I can I mean, recall, I mean it's it's Texas definitely gonna be, made it got to be a top five all time. Texas season. made it something a little late um, in that game. Yeah, I'm up there. I don't know, maybe not overall team, but I, I think maybe it won't get the respect it deserves team wise because I mean they did beat the top four teams preseason. They beat Alabama, uh, Georgia, Oklahoma, and Clemson. I'm not in that order, but they, right. they yeah. you know they 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 played people. I don't care what anybody says. They laugh about their strength of schedule. Nobody in the country is playing twelve hard hitters. Like nobody in the country is playing, you know, ten top twenty five teams. It just doesn't work that way. Conferences aren't aligned that way. Recruiting doesn't break down that way. Scheduling doesn't work that way because these schedules, right. it's not like LSU can wake up and be like, you know, hey, Baylor came on real strong. Let's put them on the schedule next year. No, you LSU is going to say, hey, Baylor, get on the schedule in 2024. And by then, Baylor could be trash again. Right. You, you never know. So I don't want to hear all that, but they're probably not going to get the respect they deserve because that defense did give up some points at times. But Joe Burrow has to go down is the greatest quarterback performance. And and I'm even hesitant to give him greatest player because, like, you are going to make the argument there were some good receivers there. But, I mean, you throw 60 touchdowns. It's not like it's a Tim Tebow year where he threw 30 and then ran for 20. I mean, he put 60 in the air. That's right. hard to do at any level against any set of competition. That's that's what you see in these dominant beat down high school, you know, kids yeah, who right. just play nobodies and they just throw up the, the ball. And yes, I mean what one guy ended with twenty touchdowns. I think Chase, the, the number one Chase kid, he finished with twenty touchdowns. Uh the other one finished Jefferson finished with eighteen. And then the number six kid that no one talks about, I think it's Marshall finishes with 13 touchdowns that's that's absurd I mean those are great numbers and 
you know, because not to dog my team any, and because I think Kentucky had a really strong year. You look at, I think our leading receiver had 13 catches. <laughs> right. And well, their third leading touchdown. Now, look, I know we had Lynn Bowden and things went awry. I'm, I'm here for this. I'm here to defend my squad. But let's not, I mean, let's just not act like, oh, well, he's got good receivers. Those numbers are instantly going to pop up. Let's go to the other side. I was very, su- I was surprised. And then maybe my surprise reset my expectation and led me to be disappointed. Because in the first half, which we were doing, we were recording last night, Mike. So in the first half, I saw Clemson had a 17-7 lead. Naturally, I guess I just assumed that Trevor Lawrence played solid. And then once I started to watch, I saw Trevor Lawrence not play solid. Actually play the opposite of solid. Right. And it, it it's kind of funny that and, and I'm, I'm actually excited about it, even though uh, we've gotten a long run of Alabama and Clemson. Two years ago, Tua, Tunga, Tua Tagovailoa came off the bench and beat Georgia in the national championship as a freshman. Right. And everyone just assumed he was going to rally off three straight national championships. Tua then comes in in the championship game last year, and that Alabama team gets waxed by a freshman – Trevor Lawrence. And then everybody <laughs> just assumes Trevor Lawrence is going to rally off three national championships. Right. And then Trevor Lawrence gets on the stage again, which we've seen him perform. We know he can. And kind of just lays a dud. I mean, he's got equally as good receivers, Mike. I mean, T. Higgins is a first round pick. Ross, when he comes out, probably next year's draft's a first round pick. I I, I was I I don't want to say I was disappointed because I thought that Trevor Lawrence has kind of played lackadaisical, which you are nothing against him, which you tend to do when you go undefeated, when you win a national title, and then when you come out and you play in a conference that is very weak as the ACC was this year. So, you know, it's very easy to fall asleep. I I saw him come alive when he got targeted. You put air quotes around that, Mike. Against Ohio State, he came alive, led them to victory, but I didn't really give him much hope to beat LSU. And then I guess when I saw him say, oh, this is big time Trevor. You know, this is big lights, Trevor. This is what we saw against Bama a year ago. I guess then when I sat down and actually watched him in the second half, I was like, oh, wait, no, this isn't that Trevor. So a little disappointed on that end, Mike. But overall, I think I think LSU from about when they hit six and zero, seven and zero, they decided that that was them. I think right. they had one. I'm trying to remember who it was. It was like an ugly win. I think maybe Ole Miss, maybe the week before LSU was kind of toying around with them, looked kind of sloppy, and then they came out, beat Alabama, demolished Texas A and M. And then just, I mean, Joe Burrow just destroyed Oklahoma. So I can't be too mad. On a scale of 1 to 10, Mike, what would you hit? Are you alarmed at all that Trevor Lawrence might fall as one of those quarterbacks great in college? We'll forget about him in the pros. Uh, You know, he is only a sophomore, so he has at least another year Mm -hmm. in college to grow as a player, get bigger, get 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 stronger etc uh we have to take this into a, into account if i if my memory serves you right here this is his first loss since junior high well I, I think grade. he lost his senior year in high school i think oh, he okay. lost so yeah so okay, but still so, i mean so you play a he's freshman lost year two in a games in six years okay fair enough you, uh, most most people say you like you learn more about yourself after you lose a game I I think we see a new Trevor Lawrence come out next college football season, the the, the 2020 2021 season, and you see a guy on a mission. You see him, you know, have this great arm strength, incredible accuracy. I, I bet you he is, like I bet you he is in the gym right now on the field trying to perf- trying to perfect his craft because he he wants to be the number one overall pick and. LSU exposed him. LSU uh, knew what he could not do well, and they exposed him. It, it, the, the, you can call it out coaching. You can call it out playing. 
you can you can like you can call it crumbling under like under like under the lights. Call it what you want to call it. But Trevor Lawrence is going to come out next year. He's going to be firing on all cylinders, become a first overall pick, and he is going to have a pretty good NFL season. Or uh, sorry, a NFL career. Um, thinking of a guy here, maybe like a Ryan Tannehill. You know, you can say he like. I, I like, don't know if Ryan Tannehill would be considered right quite a NFL great or solid career quite yet. I, I, I am referring to the last uh, nine, the, the the last nine games of this season <laughs> when he's taken over starter at. Not a Tennessee. hot take at all, Mike. Not not <laughs> you're not coming in there. You're not jumping the gun there, Mike. We got thirty seconds, real quick. I do think Trevor Lawrence had a concussion. He looked like he was out of it at the end of that game. I don't know. LSU. He is such a he's, he's probably all right. out of it. He's probably all out of it. 20 seconds. Who right now is your favorite to win it next year? Uh, you know, if Tua co- or no, Tua has declared for the NFL draft. Tua's so, gone. Uh, you know, I really like Texas. To be oh. honest. <laughs> if really you like let Texas, Texas fans hear say it, Texas is always <laughs> back. Uh, I'm sure we'll all get an off season of hearing. No, it. no, 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 no. Iowa State. Dark Iowa State. Iowa State. Now, I, no, Iowa State. see, Mike. Football does <laughs> not lend itself to that level of dark horses. If you wanted to say Auburn with Bo Nix, <sighs> I'm here for that. Iowa State. Ah, I don't even know if their their schedule dictates that. We got our final break. When we come back, we're going to dive around the sports world again. We got, we're going to talk a little college basketball. Might even dabble a little bit in the XFL. See what else is going on. We'll be right back with the Matthew Lyle Show. Welcome back to the Matthew Lyle Show. It's your host, as always, Matthew Lyle, the back-to-back returning champion ho- co-host, special guest, whatever you're going to call him, Buck Nasty, Mr. Michael Buckheister himself. This is segment three. We spent the last couple of segments diving into some college football, talking Luke Keekley retired. I hope everything's okay with him. You, you hate to see somebody being forced away from the game, but you love to see somebody taking an opportunity to do something they love it if that's what they want to do. We're going we're gonna to talk a little other sports. We're getting into college basketball, Mike. This is when the when the oven's starting to really heat up. We're starting to get everybody go. The matchups are good. Right now, I put out a top twenty five list. Which first off, let, let me a little tangent. This is why <laughs> this is why I want to get to a point where I we can do a call in show because I feast best of other people's shenanigans. <laughs> so I love. One of the small things is, Mike, this is just for the audience out there. This is episode two. Let's just be, we'll just be completely honest with you. This is episode two of the Matthew Lyle show, but I've been, I've been churning out some content on social media and I already love the hate. And I don't, I don't love the blatant hate, the, the ignorance, ignorant hate, the blind hate, whether like, oh, you're an idiot, F you, uh, I hope your family dies. You know, I don't like all that. I'm not here for that. <laughs> but I like the rationing behind other people's minds. So I dropped my college basketball top 25, did a little bit of shuffling because I truly think Baylor is number one. I think the Baylor Bears, they've, they've got five rank wins. They've got one tough loss to a healthy Washington team very early in the season. So they lost a game. It happens. Then I got uh, Gonzaga. I think Gonzaga kind of does play impressive early on. Then they get into this lackadaisical soft schedule. I'm not going to reward that. I got undefeated Auburn at three, and then I, I want to say I got Duke somewhere around there at four. I don't, I don't have the list in front of me. Anyway, and then when you get to the bottom, if you look at every rankings ever, if you go to CBS, if you go to, if you go to AP Po, if you go to Coaches Po, if you go to any ranking system out here, the top, the bottom five is where it kind of gets sloppy because it's where you kind of get like this smorgasbord of 20 teams and you right. pick the five, you're picking the best of the rest, right? So I put mine out there. Guy comes at me and says, you're wrong, which love that. Please tell <laughs> me how I'm wrong. So he proceeds to then show me his, the, the top 25 of the AP. And I said, hey, bud, that's theirs. This is ours. 
And he's like, well, why would you do such a thing? And I'm like, I don't know. Why would anyone ever share their opinion? I, who knows? I feel like being a bad person today. <laughs> he then tells me that he's going to ignore mine because he only deals in facts. So first off, and, and I get this a lot, Mike. I love if you guys heard that, that that was me cranking my head like what? I love <laughs> rankings. I love rankings. I love power rankings. You can never give me two. I love the top twenty-five football for twenty twenty. Like I love, and, and the season's been over for about eighteen hours, twenty-one hours. I love rankings. But there is no, and, and for some reason, people will find a ranking that fits their desires, fits their team, and then all of a sudden, it becomes facts. Like I don't know how. Like the AP, yes, those are experienced writers. Those are people who probably watch more basketball in a day than I will watch all season. But those still aren't facts. Opinionated facts. Those are a, 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 a very loosely using the word fact there, Mike. But it just cracked me up. I mean, the committee doesn't even use the word facts. So it cracks me up. Everybody, they love their rankings. And, and I think it's just a more of, of a showing of today's times or maybe just society in a whole, as a whole is you just find the argument that fits you and you just hold on to it like it's undisputed facts. So I feel like that's just life. But I, I got a kick out of that. So well, let me let me validate your rankings here a tad bit. I have the AP love top validation. 25 right in front of my face and they do have gonzaga at number one and then Baylor Still, right. number two but I flip those, and they both have one loss but right? uh yeah they do both have one loss okay but look at this gonzaga has 30 number one votes baylor has 31 number one votes so how does look, that i don't out? know see i don't know the facts mike you, you're yeah. messing up the facts you can't get the facts wrong here <laughs> sir they just don't love the Big 12. Face it, the Big 12 is going to have probably five they love, elite eight teams. They love that Western Athletic Conference. They don't yeah, love they do. the Big 12. They love the WAC. San so, Diego State sticking in the top 10, number seven. They are. I, for, I forgot where I put them, Mike. So, anyway, I, I should have had that in front of me. Should have been prepared, but I wasn't. So, I look at this, and I'm a Kentucky fan, and I and, and Kentucky is my passion. Kentucky basketball is the I, I literally have a show called Bleeding His Knees Blues. I bleed, bleed, blue, bleeding blue. Mike, you, you, you came in my vote. You came in my headphone like something crazy. But I will. I cannot hide my love for Kentucky, and I can't talk myself out of them being in the Final Four. And I, this is not going to be a Kentucky show, but I think they are the Final Four team right now. My final four on January 15th is Kentucky, Gonzaga, Auburn, Villanova. Now, all that's pending on matchups, you know, if, if, if this team gets in the depth bracket. But that right now, that's my final four. Kentucky, Gonzaga, Villanova, Auburn. Two SEC teams and two teams that are of late. Pretty powerful. Mike, what is your final four? You know, I have to really totally disagree with you on this because of the statement well, you can that get you off made. the show then, Mike. <laughs> it's basically because of the statement that you made on yesterday's show. Gonzaga doesn't play anybody until mm-hmm. March. So why do you have them going to the Final Four when the first good team that they played in two months is uh, in the Sweet 16? So I, so I got to knock them out. Um, I do like Kentucky in there. Uh, they are that they will peak. You know, I am a Kentucky fan as well. So, like, I mean, maybe some bias, but I, I really do think they will slide up in there. Next up, you have to look at Wichita State. Uh, they have been there before, uh, what, a couple years, five, six years ago. So, I mean, the pedigree is there. Uh, but, you know, they are going to shock some people this year. I think they will slide. They will slide in there. Another team is Texas Tech to watch out for. Um, I do like what they're doing down there in, in Lubbock. And it's just something about that team. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were there last year too. Uh, so been there, done that yeah, type run, run. of thing. And then you have to look at the Michigan State. Yes, they suffered a first a first loss of the year to, to Kentucky. But Izzo always seems to get his team ready to play in March. And you cannot overlook the Spartans. So Izzo gets his team ready to play in March. They don't get past the Elite Eight. So I, I – so – Yes, I made that point about Gonzaga yesterday, but this is that one year that's going to be different. This is that one year that there isn't really an elite team. 
So I think what's going to happen is Gonzaga is going to skate through their conference. They're going to get that bracket. They're going to get that seed. They're going to get that easier bracket. And then there's going to be really no one in that in that bracket that's going to give them a run for their money, unlike previous years. And that's I'm sure logic. they'll put a two seat. They'll put a two seat in there that's going to be something you know somewhat challenging. But I don't trust that whoever that two seat is doesn't get upset, especially having to go play out West. And I hate to say it, I think one of the brackets I've seen had Kentucky as a four seed. That makes me nervous. Right. That makes me nervous because you're going to be probably, I don't know what the breakdown is of the divisions or of the uh, the regions, but you're probably going to be out West playing a Gonzaga team in a year where there isn't a true blue ahead of anybody number one. That makes me very nervous. But I think they're going to get to the Final Four. I think you're going to have – Kentucky, Villanova for the championship game. And I got to watch more basketball to see what I feel of that. I feel like Villanova could be that team that beats Kentucky. You know, I feel like Villanova could be that type of team. We talked about this on another show, Mike, that could catch Cal sleeping. So be interested to see. Right now, it's just fun to watch. It's just fun because the, 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 the teams with the top five, in front of their names, unless they are kind of Gonzaga going through that easy coast. I mean, Duke, did you say they was in a slug fight with uh, or a rock fight or whatever you want to call it with um, with Clemson? Yeah, let's what's see. That final, the, what's that let's final see score end up being? Let me uh, pull it up for you here real quick. Be like the like the last I saw it was a uh, 55-53 Clemson. I mean, of course, you know, the game is over by now. Uh, so right. Well, do, Clemson did. There we go. Clemson did. They did pull out the win, seventy nine, seventy two. Clemson beat Duke. So Clemson beat Duke. Clemson was that? Was that at Clemson? Was that North Carolina? It was at. Duke? It was at Clemson. Okay, well, because Clemson went into North Carolina and won for the first time in what probably forever. Of course, North Carolina. You can say they're down. You know, whether they're eight and seven now. Worst well, they are now, but I mean, let's not act. Right, but North Carolina's had down years in the past, and Clemson still hasn't gotten it done. Right. Mike, while you're looking it up, give me that Louisville Pitt score. Uh, so Louisville did pull out the win in overtime, seventy-three ah. sixty-eight. All right, fair enough, fair enough. So look, look, just like that, we speak it. I had Duke, I think, is the number four seed or the number four team in the country, and they lose to Clemson. So Monday, when my rankings come out, or Tuesday, whatever day I decide to do them, that will inevitably be the different. Uh, you got Auburn's. You know, the SEC, you can say that it's good. You can say that it's bad. At the least, it's going to be competitive with each other. So I don't know what Auburn's got ahead of it. Uh, Baylor, I haven't got to watch them as much as I like. I watched them play Kansas. That Big 12 always seems kind of pesky. So, but I, I, I can, for some reason, I can just see Baylor being that one team that falls short in the, in the tournament. Yeah, so uh, I mean, like historically, uh, a couple years ago, you know, uh, I believe the Baylor boys and girls were both the number one overall seeds going into the tournament, and Baylor ended up losing like the second round. It's just they are not a March team for some reason, and and I'm going out on that limb saying that they'll do well, uh, but like I don't see them making it to the final, final four. One team that I really need to watch though is San Diego State that they are holding that seven seed or a, a seventh, seventh ranking in the AP poll, I have not watched him play basketball at all. So, like, I wonder if it's, you know, if 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 my eyes will tell me that they're a top 10 team. But, like, historically, like, uh, you know, San Diego State just seems to be the best team in a poor conference, and they, and they always seem to get the nod. I'm not sure what conference they're in. I'll have to do some homework. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here, Mike. I want to talk about something. It's a couple of days old, but I'm going to go through some of the XFL rules. And which ones look like they're going to change the game. Look like they might. Make a difference or might just make the game. So we'll see what we have here. Uh, first off, on a scale of one to ten, how excited are you about the XFL? You know, last night I was at an eight, and then and then once you told me the double pass rule, uh, that made me jump up to to like a nine. Uh, I, I mean, did like, for, I forget I asked you that yesterday. Yeah, uh, I got to go out uh, on a limb here and like a lot. I can say like I have not looked at the XFL rules. Um, 
I like I know who the teams are. I know when the season starts. But other than that, I haven't really dug too much into the XFL. Uh, so, you know, talking about it, it is making me excited. Uh, I'm going to jump on the Internet here after the show and, uh, and, and definitely learn the rules because that okay. double pass is so, really intriguing. I'm going to save you a little bit of time. We're going to go through some of the rules. This isn't all of them. This is just some of them. I'm going to read them to you, Mike. Punts. The XFL punt rule eliminates the coughing corner punt by spotting any kick that goes out of bounds at the 35-yard line. The same goes for a punt that travels into the end zone. So, you know, you've all the time had – so basically the only time – the only way you can pin somebody at like the one-yard line is if it gets there in the field of play. So if you try to kick it out of bounds at the 10, nope, going to the 35-yard line. You kick it out the back of the end zone – going to the 35-yard line. So I think that's interesting. I think you're going to see – you're at least – you're not – I don't know. I mean, I guess if you if the other team had a, an explosive punt returner and you were trying to avoid him, you would just take the spot at 35, right? Like, I mean, because I know, punt, you know punters are kicking out of bounds to avoid, you know, their version of the Tyreek Hill. I don't think they'll have a Tyreek Hill in the XFL, but, you know, they're, their version – but I mean, I guess if you're that worried about the guy, you just kick it out of bounds. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I like that. Like that rule kind of seems like they're trying to take punting out of the game in general. So, so uh, make it. More I think it makes it more down. Well, and, and that is a, that is what that's kind of where I was going to go, Mike. It makes me think that okay, if I got the ball on the fifty, or I got the ball on the forty-five, you know, that's still a what a fifty-nine right. yard field goal. You're not making that, especially at this level. So now you're like punt team. Well, shoot, if you're on the 45 and you punt it too far and it goes out of bounds or in the end zone, they're only getting it 10 yards back. Right. You might as well go for it. So I, I'm i on a scale of 1 to 10. I'm giving that one like an 8. I'm excited about that one. Yeah. Uh, I uh, mean, like, there is something, though, about a good, like, about a good punt that, that, now, Mike, that, like, don't punt bog, the guy down like the one. I mean, don't I don't bog the show down with defense. We ain't got time for that, Mike. You, you know how <laughs> you, let's, let's not bog this show down with with words like smash mouth and, and witty <laughs> plays. I, we ain't got time for this, Mike. This one I am a fan of. There will be no kick extra points in the XFL. Instead, teams will choose one of three options after scoring a touchdown. They can attempt to play from the two yard line for one point from the five-yard line from two points, or from the 10-yard line from three points. A defensive return of a turnover is worth the same number of points that the offense was attempting to score. So, Mike, that sounds amazing. That's what we're talking about. That's the right. kind of hard-hitting stuff I'm here to see. But there's a part of me, the new part of me, that lives in Indiana and has really taken a liking to the sports gambling. That's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> right. Uh, because your like mind's used kinda... to football numbers, right? Like your mind's used to 7, 14, yeah. 24, 10, 3. And now you you mean to tell me that you can get a touchdown and the game could be 9 to 9? Right. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, I mean, like that definitely tells you that they are trying to take kicking out of the game because of the punt rule. And uh, I, I did hear the kickoff rule, too. That like you cannot move until, like until the ball is caught. Uh, so yeah, you know, like like that's kind of cool too. I saw uh, that, um, but I, I wasn't aware of the rule, and it was like five paragraphs, Mike, and I didn't want to yeah. like bog down the segment by reading a, a, a novel. I just you know I'm, I'm hitting the shorter points. So I'm glad you kind of mentioned that because I did see that there was a kickoff rule. Well, remember last year, Mike, I put on my conspiracy theory hat. I put up the, the aluminum foil on my head, <laughs> and I said. I think the the, the NFL is doing something because everybody was shanking extra points. They were missing game one and field goals. I, I the, the NFL was waiting. I think they were weighing down these kicking balls. I think they were trying to get rid of the extra point or they're trying to get rid of the kicking portion. Yeah. So the, the XFL says, you know what? We're going to be blatant about it. Okay, here's the one we were talking about, Mike. Double forward pass. Teams will, permitted, teams will be permitted to attempt two forward passes on a single play provided that the ball does not cross the line of scrimmage before the second pass. So basically they are just taking out any aspect of the, uh, was it the music city miracle? What was that? 2001 or 2002 uh, when they got the kickoff and they, and they threw the ball. Well, I mean, forward. 
Well, that, that that really doesn't go into effect here because I I still think that's illegal in this league because there's no line of scrimmage. Uh, that is interesting of how they'll word it to prevent that kind of thinking because since there is no line of scrimmage, I think you still have to go backwards. But I am very intrigued by what all comes of because I mean, if you just look at college football, NFL things that have kind of developed. You know, you got the little touch pass where they'll they'll take the snap and then they'll yep. just bat it. Like right. so, in theory, since that doesn't cross the line of scrimmage, that receiver could still run his end around and then throw it. Right? Yeah. So, me like the football coach in me is starting just to take over. Like, so I'm going to run a screen, a screen, a screen pass. Tell my quarterback to drop 15 yards. Bring the defensive line way up. Yeah. Throw it. Throw a 15 yard pass to my second quarterback on the field that is still behind the line of scrimmage, and then I can throw it 65 yards down the field to a screaming receiver. Right. Like, well, and, and that, here's the crazy thing, to me. Here's the thing that excites me as an offensive guy and would probably drive defensive-minded guys crazy. So, for example, when a team in the NFL or college or any other level of football wants to do some shenanigans, when they want to do trickery, when they want to do – the, the wide receiver pass or the halfback pass, they have to – there's risk involved, right? Like if I'm lined up at quarterback and you're lined up 20 yards away as receiver, I have to throw the ball backwards to you and guys are running at you. So now if you drop it, that's a fumble. Right. So you got to pick that ball up and hope to throw it away at a position you're not really familiar to playing. you got to do all this risk. For hopes that I've caught you off guard and I have a guy running free down the field. So, so there's a lot question, of risk. So there's a lot of risk, but it equals out because your hope is big risk. This league, from my sound of it, and I don't know how you would dictate this, if I do that little wide receiver touch pass and you drop it, incomplete pass, play over, right. big deal. But, and so now you're as a defense, you're crashing in on me because it was a forward pass. I can run side to side as much as I want, and I'm still moving forward as long as I don't cross the line of scrimmage. Like, that that seems like I'm excited about it, but that seems like a nightmare for defensive coordinators. Yeah, I, uh, go ahead with your thought. I'm looking at something here. Yeah, it, uh, it, like, it, like it also, like two points here, it, like it makes it a nightmare for the average viewer that's like, like hey, what are you doing? You can't do that. So I feel like the average viewer is going to get really upset. Like, hey, he threw the ball twice. Why can't they do that in the in the NFL? Well, and then my second I feel like point, your average viewer is going to be enticed. You're like, whoa, okay, now I got to stick around because what else can true. I see? And I think you know, I don't, I don't remember exactly the coaches. I know at one point Bob Stoops was supposed to do one of them. I don't know if he still's in the XFL, but it's kind of cool if you can get like a Steve Spurrier, if you can get these offensive minded coaches who might be just a good coordinator in, in the pro in the NFL can come be a great coach in the XFL because now they can just be silly. It's almost like college, but you can just be silly because there's a little downside. No, do you want to you want to be silly? This is the play that would drive people crazy. You have a slot receiver, you throw the ball backwards to to him, the quarterback rolls out, you throw the ball back to the quarterback, and then you have receivers running uh, three, four, five move routes because there's so much time in the backfield. And since the second pass was the first forward pass, and then you throw it down the ball again. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, you could. That I mean, would be intriguing. Because see, yeah, I mean that. Because that's what I would do is I would actually have my quarterback, the guy who can pass, the guy who actually throws, throw the backward lateral. Right. Exactly. And then I would have my receiver throw the forward pass. Because he's not used to doing that, so if it goes wrong, it's still an incomplete pass. And then I would have him throwing to another receiver who has the intentions, or maybe even back to the quarterback, who then has the intentions of throwing the 50-yard bomb. So I'm yeah. very excited about it. Going to bust through these other ones. We're almost running out of time. Going to bust through these others. And just get some quick thoughts if you got anything. Overtime. Games tied after the conclusion of regulation will advance to a shootout-style overtime period in which teams will have five chances to score on a single play from the five-yard line. That sounds a lot like the the hockey uh, – Yeah, right. I don't know what it's called. I'm, I'm not a hockey fan. It's fun to watch, but I have the no clue what it is. 
The shootout, yes, nice, nice. I mean, I did call it a shootout style, so I probably should have known. Other quick rules. Only one foot in bounds required for a successful catch. A running clock outside of the game's final two minutes. A 25-second play clock. Play clock. Two timeouts per half. A 10-minute halftime. That's going to be tiring. Coach to player communication devices in all helmets of in, in, in the helmets of all offensive skill positions. And the audio of which will be made available to the broadcasters. So the broadcaster can play what you're hearing. That's no cool. coach, no, it, it is. I'm just curious how how free they'll get with it because a lot of times, you know, they'll like when you hear these inside the huddles, they'll make a deal like you can record me being motivational. You can't record me talking actual schemes. Right. So I'll be interested to see what you can hear. No coaches challenge. I'll review come the replay uh, from the replay official. That's that takes a little strategy out of it, but it if I could see how it could lead to more scoring. Offensive linemen or linemen are allowed to be three yards from the line of scrimmage before being flagged for a legal man down the field college compared rules. to one yard. Yeah, college. So college, high school probably. So, yeah, I mean, that, I'm telling you, the trick plays are going to be here because you can set them up more. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Like you can like you can really ride an RPO at this level because you can let them linemen get three yards engaged and really read the crap out of an RPO. Yeah. So I, I'm really so. excited about that. But hey, we so I'm actually more excited about that than I am the rest of the playoffs. Unless <laughs> we get Mahomes, Rogers, I don't want anything boring. I don't want this smash mouth. But Mike, that is it. January fifteenth. I'm a horrible at days. I need a calendar. Matthew Lyle show. I'm your host, Matthew Lyle. Thank you once again, Mike Buck Nicey, for joining me. That is it. We'll see you again, same time, same channel, same network tomorrow.